There's no me in team, but there is in meat. Hmm. Anyway, it's NES Works, episode 98. I'm boiling a roast. How hot and wet do you like it? When I talk about the NES, it's almost always in terms of the US experience. But it was a North American system. And here's Konami proving that Canada was an important part of that equation, with its port of Blades of Steel. Arriving a solid year after Double Dribble, Blades of Steel takes the Konami house style into the world of Ursatz NHL. What you have is a great looking hockey game with sparse though excellent audio and incredibly simplistic yet satisfying gameplay. As with Double Dribble, this cart contains a fast-paced and highly accessible take on its respective sport, starring a variety of not-quite-trademark-infringing teams. The game's arcade origins shine through clearly, and while the NES adaptation obviously doesn't compare to the coin-op in terms of visuals, it plays well. Along with Nintendo's own PAX Softnica-developed ice hockey, NHL-inspired games bookend the year. Blades of Steel manages not to feel redundant, despite being the second hockey sim for the console in the same year, because it looks and plays differently from Nintendo's game. Where Ice Hockey featured goofy looking little cartoon guys who offered three distinct character traits depending on their appearance, Blades of Steel presents more natural looking players who, in a somewhat contradictory fashion, field a less varied set of abilities. The players here showcase Konami's house style previously seen in Castlevania, Russian Attack, and Metal Gear, realistically proportioned adults with slightly alarming blank voids for faces. Compared to Double Dribble, both the players and the rink they inhabit look a little more detailed and move a little more smoothly, although the sprites tend to flicker pretty dramatically as the action thickens and a bunch of guys skate into the same line of action, the game manages to avoid significant slowdown, maintaining a fairly steady pace. However, although Blades of Steel looks a lot more convincing than Ice Hockey, which seemingly hails from an earlier generation of NES and Famicom software design, the same does not necessarily hold true for its gameplay. Where Ice Hockey presented players with the ability to strategically customize their teams to balance out speed, defense, and power, Blades of Steel gives you a bunch of dudes who all look and play identically to one another. Your team members have no stats to speak of, and to my knowledge, even the teams themselves don't have the hidden advantages that certain Double Dribble franchises possessed. The eight team selections essentially amount to an opportunity to select your favorite color and city allegiance rather than giving you a sophisticated array of unique capabilities. One thing that does carry over from Double Dribble is the lack of a pro league or player license. Blades of Steel's eight teams hail from four Canadian and four US cities that hosted actual National Hockey League teams at the time, but just enough of the details have been altered or obscured to curtail legal action. To its credit, this is the best Canadian representation yet seen on NES, and will probably remain so until about 1992 when the adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle arrives. It's the little things, eh? Blades of Steel also has a few other tricks to distinguish itself from Nintendo's ice hockey. For starters, it replaces Double Dribble's halftime cheerleader routine with a big Jumbotron showcase. The Jumbotron demo has a 50% chance of launching a Gradius minigame, in which you have a few seconds to take out a big core boss ship. It's pretty slight in the grand scheme of things, but the novelty it presented, and the Konami esprit de corps that it spoke to, definitely reinforced the sensation that the developers had put their all into this cartridge. More memorably, of course, Blades of Steel included the opportunity to duke it out with opposing players. These scenes effectively replaced Double Dribble's showy slam dunk cutscene visuals, appearing about as frequently, though obviously packing less of a graphical punch than those full screen slideshows. Although some may lament the loss of Double Dribble's stylish showpieces, the change speaks to Konami's desire to engage each sport on its own terms. Basketball tends to be about showy, heroic plays by individuals. Hockey's blazing fast pace and the visual anonymity created by its bulky uniforms and padding reduces the focus on individual actions and moment-to-moment -moment plays. Rather than attempting to distill some sort of splashy play graphic from the ebb and flow of the action on the ice here, Blades of Steel instead celebrates the aggressive spirit of the sport. If you body check a competing player, they'll lose their temper and engage your fielder in a fight. When a fight breaks out, the screen perspective shifts to an enclosed viewpoint resembling the versus mode in Double Dragon or oh, Urban Champion. 
We're still a few years ahead of the breakthrough fighting games like Street Fighter 2 and Fatal Fury here, so these brawling sequences offer about the same degree of complexity as the standard hockey mode, which is to say, none whatsoever. I suppose this might be the closest thing Blades of Steel really has to strategic depth, getting involved in dust-ups to hobble the other team with penalties. It's not much, but I suppose it's something. I don't know if I'd really call the lack of substance to Blades of Steel's design a shortcoming, though. It kind of seems to be the point, a dumb, pick up and play take on the sport that anyone can jump into with no real understanding of the underlying game. Is it as good as Nintendo's ice hockey? I think it ultimately comes down to a matter of personal taste. Do you prefer realistic-ish visuals or greater team customization? By my count, the NES would only ever see a total of four hockey titles, and the next one wouldn't arrive until 1991. That gave both ice hockey and Blades of Steel remarkably long legs, and as a result, both would go on to rank among the most successful and beloved sports games on the system. Certainly Blades of Steel fared well enough that Ultra Games would publish a Game Boy adaptation in 1991, and the series would continue to exist as a franchise into the Nintendo 64 and Game Boy Color eras. Those latter-day games would ship under license from the NHL, with more complex stats and play. Which of course raises the question of whether or not those later releases really even count as Blades of Steel. But that's a question for some other video series. Here on NES, Blades of Steel punched its way into our consoles and our hearts. Those knuckleheads at Bondi are at it again. They keep making the mistake of thinking that when kids asked for sports games on NES, they actually wanted to play sports. Yes, Super Team Games is another Bondi-published sports thing designed around the power pad peripheral. And following on the heels of Nintendo yoinking stadium events to republish as a first-party title called World Class Track Meet, Super Team Games also wears the first-party Nintendo banner in the US. That makes for quite an autumn slate from Nintendo for 88. Two major franchise sequels that significantly advance the state of video game art, and softball family appeal type releases with this in anticipation. You can really see Nintendo covering all the bases here, catering to core gamers, not that such a term existed in 1988, and more casual audiences. This two-pronged approach would continue to serve the company well, all the way until, well, right now. I gotta say though, power pad games like this Sure ain't we sports. Super Team Games, like Athletic World, amounts to a set of races controlled by way of the power pad. That is to say you pump away at the control pad with your tiny feet. And I do mean tiny. Super Team Games by design really only works for kids or very petite players. Multiplayer mode requires at least two people to use the power pad simultaneously, side by side, which amounts to a lot of jostling for anyone larger than, say, 4'11 and 90 pounds. The team games referred to in the title expect you to pack up to six human beings on a single power pad at the same time. This seems like it would be almost physically impossible for anyone besides tiny children or else adults who are very, very comfortable with strenuous, intimate contact with several other people at once. So while this makes a perfect game for your polycule, it's not necessarily ideal for maintaining social distancing during convention play. Anyway. The races here primarily revolve around the control input dynamic you'd expect, slamming the pad triggers with your feet to simulate running. Several of the events do mix things up. For example, there's an entire skateboard mode, which requires footwork so complex that the manual has to spell it out with what appears to be dance steps. Equally unusual is the crab walk, which requires you to stand sideways on the power pad with your legs stretched to stand on the pads at the opposite ends of the controller and you can only participate in the bubble race sequence by standing on the center pads and leaning over to pound the forward pads with your hands to simulate using a pump to inflate a bubble that you ride in. Now, given my monogamous marriage, I wasn't able to take super team games to a swingers party to test out the six player activities, like six-legged race, relay race, and tug of war. So I can only really weigh in on the basic game modes. In addition to the standalone skateboard mode, which you could best described as the skating mode from TNC Surf Design meets Street Dancing, Super Team Games contains three different one or two player modes. Race A works as a sort of triathlon that combines the log hop, the water cross, and the wall jump. Mode B also plays as a triathlon, featuring the belly bump ball, crab walk, and bubble run events. Finally, the Super Race combines all six events into a grueling protracted slog. 
Six players can compete against one of three different AI competitors, each of whom represents a different difficulty level. However you mix them, these events all work the same and all require you to flail about on a plastic pressure-sensitive tarp to awkwardly make your way to the finish line before the competition. It's kind of like track and field or winter games, but with the added frustration of an imprecise input device measuring out your progress. Although some of these modes do offer a touch of novelty, like the awkward crab walk and the goofy ball mode in which your little avatar has to smash a beach ball with his belly in order to push it toward the finish line, it all feels more or less the same as the previous PowerPad games. Debuting in November, Super Team Games clearly represents a bid by Nintendo to capitalize on parents or grandparents who wanted to buy their Tykes and NES game, the hottest toy of Christmas 88, while still feeling like they were doing something responsible to promote the little one's well-being. And that means hundreds of thousands of devastated children on December 25th, tearing open the wrapping paper on a gift the size of an NES game, only to find the video game equivalent of dry whole wheat toast. That's the true Super Team Games legacy. A cacophony of disappointed young voices rising up as one to proclaim a half-hearted, thanks grandma and grandpa. Oh, and what did Nintendo Power say? Nothing but nice things, I assure you. Issue 3 of Nintendo Power included a four-page breakdown of Blades of Steel. This modest feature had the odd side effect of making it seem somewhat like a lesser game, given that its fellow Konami-developed sports extravaganza, Track and Field 2, appeared as the cover story of that issue and sprawled across a much larger amount of real estate. That didn't seem to phase the magazine's readers, though. Blades of Steel took the fan vote for Best Player vs. Player Game of 1988 in the publication's inaugural Power Awards in issue 6. As for Super Team Games, even Nintendo seemed to realize its workout games made for a tough sell to its primary audience. The magazine lumped all the PowerPad games into a brief and extremely visual, which is to say light on real information, combined feature in issue 5 called the PowerPad Playoffs 89. Next time on NES Works, Ultra Games offers us a fatal binary choice.